GM friends. Yes, as you can tell, I'm in jail. It turns out that my beard had a highly illegal design and Interpol, after watching the entire series of School to Block, finally decided to break down the door and take me into custody. But now I have a dilemma, a prisoner's dilemma. In order to get out, I have to work out whether to cooperate or betray this wretched lag. I want to get you, son. Or maybe I won't. All I can say is that it's a good thing I just swatted up on my game theory, because the driving mechanisms of the place I come from, the high-octane, all-action world of crypto, are fundamentally dictated by it. Only in crypto, the genius is there's only one choice that actually works, and that is cooperation. And why does this matter? Why should you care? Why could this just maybe change the world? Well, let me stitch up this hapless crim, bust out of jail, and I'll show you why. Welcome to School of Block. And if you want more illegal beards on your feed, please do like and subscribe. It really does help us make more of this fine content, helping you find your financial freedom. Gotta go, gotta go! You, me, people everywhere. What do they want? Generally speaking, what's best for them? Are they fussed about what's best for anyone else? Not so much. So how have societies managed historically to deal with this problem? What do they do to make sure we don't just run around robbing and pillaging? Well, we have rules, otherwise known as laws. You can do this, but you most definitely can't do that, at least until we change the rules tomorrow. But by setting out a range of restrictions and punitive measures over the centuries, they broadly kept society in check. But is this top-down coercion really the best way? Is a zero-sum game the only way we can play this? And by zero-sum, we mean that uh, if you add what I have to what you have, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take that, what that means is, more for me means, ah, you know what, it's gonna take all of it. it. Means less for you, and vice versa. Generally speaking, this is the way the traditional model works. If you get <laughs> if you get the promotion at work, I don't. If I sell five bananas, in, and here I have six, so I'm gonna get rid of one of those and throw that to you, that's five fewer customers for you to sell to. But why can't we all be winners? Why do they have to be losers? That's a very good question, but not one that the web 2.0 data giants, and yes, for the avoidance of doubt, I'm talking about our old friends, Google and Facebook. It's one they haven't managed to answer. Who is the one making money out of your web searches or your posts or your likes, views and shares, or your aping around? Ooh, ooh, ha, ha. This is not the way that we are meant to use technology. There is a fundamental misalignment of incentives between the platforms and the users. In 2009, Bitcoin burst into this topsy-turvy traditional world with the wondrous innovation that is, and was, the world's first working blockchain. We introduced just what a blockchain is back in episode seven and why the solution for the Byzantine generals problem was crucial. Now bringing the Byzantine generals together was instrumental in turning the traditional economic and social system on its head. Now suddenly we have bottom-up incentives rather than top-down coercion. Blockchain brought the carrot to a world that had too long lived by the stick. Oh, that's the wrong one. Now user incentives were aligned and the zero-sum game consigned to the scrap heap. More for me also means more for you. This, without a hint of a clickbaity title, changes everything. But how did it do it? Well, Satoshi's creation of the proof-of-work system is what enables successful consensus amongst miners, or Byzantine generals, rewarding them in the process. Indeed, the reward of newly minted coins and transaction fees is an incentive scheme that aligns the actions of miners with the security of the network. And that all comes about through hash rate, which is the total computational power an individual miner has. Each miner is incentivized to have as high a hash rate as possible, as it increases their likelihood of validating blocks and then earning block rewards and transaction fees in the shape of that very desirable Bitcoin. 
And when all miners are incentivized as such, it has the secondary benefit of increasing the amount of energy it would take a rogue player to spend in order to alter past blocks and thus hack the blockchain. Even if you owned 51% of the hash power, how much energy would you need to spend to change history? Now, it's not just about security either. More hash power works well for everyone, from mining incentives to the price of Bitcoin itself. Now, let's say you are a miner, and here we have one, hush now, and suddenly more miners start mining. More competition is bad, right? What have you got there? Thank you. But not in this case because these extra miners further secure the network and the Bitcoin you previously earned as rewards is thus more secure and valuable. And let's say you don't actually mine Bitcoin but run a node. Why would you do that if you're not earning rewards? Well, that's because the node itself contributes to the security and the value of the ecosystem and thus to the value of the asset you're holding yourself. You're doing some of the work. Everyone is rewarded for what they give to the ecosystem. In each of these cases, we can see how the individual incentives align with the greater community to create a fundamentally meritocratic and democratic system. And it's not just the basic design of blockchain that utilizes win-win game theory. DeFi moves the game on. Certain protocols adjust and yield dynamically depending on the available liquidity. So if there's less liquidity, bear with me. Mm less secure, but the yields are higher. Rewarding you for taking that risk and vice versa. So the incentives are always aligned. The arrival of second and third generation blockchains discussed in episode 36 have taken this one step further. Decentralized autonomous organizations, social tokens and NFTs have added a cultural layer to these financial incentives. Look at the loot owners who've come together to develop a game based on the NFTs that they own. Or the bored apes. Any additional intellectual or artistic contribution from any given ape drives up the value of all apes. So when Timberland's making hip hop tracks, everybody benefits. More for me also equals more for everybody else. And these aligned incentives are one of the key reasons why the bored apes have been so successful and the floor price is enough to buy, well, a Lambo. Who got the keys to the Lambo? And DAO members everywhere who can vote on the decisions their organization takes in a completely transparent democratic process. Stop it! I voted already! The value of each of these projects is derived from the community, the artistic and intellectual contributions of its members. The positive acts of any given individual increase the value of the group. Again, the incentives are aligned. Take a look at FWB, first mentioned in episode 22. The value of the tokens shot up in value because the individuals in it contributed to the success of the entire project. Or MakerDAO, an organization dedicated to the management of the DeFi protocol Maker. The success of the project has led to over 400 platforms integrating the DAI currency, their native stablecoin, with billions of dollars of assets locked in the protocol. Not bad. It is, of course, worth being aware, though, that scammers can leverage these human tendencies to launch ever more sophisticated grifts. We've come on some of their tricksy behavior back in episodes 17 and 24. But be aware, there is such a thing as a fake NFT. And if you want to know what a rug pull looks like, then, well, it's something like this. So the market cap is $2.168 trillion. And now the market, oh! Ow! Oh, it went to zero! Yeah! Although, if we're being honest, the fact the token was called Squid Game should perhaps have given some of the people who bought in pause for thought. <laughs> One of the most revolutionary qualities of blockchain isn't the fact you can now buy and spend magical internet money. It's the way it turns established economic and societal systems on their heads. We're only just starting to see the effects of this with the development of second and third generation blockchains, but make no mistake, in a few years time, the impact is going to be huge. As our digital lives bleed inexorably into the metaverse, we're gonna be faced with a choice about where we spend that time, energy, and money. 
And as blockchain enables bottom-up metaverses owned by the people who use them, our opportunities for financial freedom will increase exponentially, as long as we choose wisely. Finding a way to encourage humans to work together rather than against each other. Let me help you out there, fella. That's gonna be perhaps blockchain's biggest achievement. I'm helping you out here, bruv. Give me some time. We've spent so long expecting that advancing our own interests will stitch someone else up that it's ingrained in our psyches, as shown in the way the prisoner's dilemma resonates with us. You know, this is made of plastic. You could have taken it off the whole time. The thing is though, win-win isn't just an idealist dream. With blockchain, it's a reality. You've been watching School of Block presented by Ledger and The Defiant. Demystifying decentralization, one pair of handcuffs at a time. Don't forget to subscribe, come on mate. Drop us a like if that's what you're into. And as always, here's to your financial freedom. Fancy a beer? <laughs>